Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on patterns and anti-patterns in Docker image life cycles. Um, my name is Mark Galpin. I am a senior solution architect with JFrog, and um, I do a lot of stuff related to um, this sort of life cycle reference architecture for CI pipelines that we're going to be talking about um, for JFrog and with our customers. Um, today is uh, going to be a pretty standard webinar. Please reserve any questions you have for the Q&A session. I will try to have um, a brief Q&A at the end of this webinar. Um, and in the meantime, I think I really want to just kind of dive right in and uh, talk a little bit about our problem set. So, Docker containers. Um, Docker containers are everywhere in the buzz around Silicon Valley, have been for, you know, a couple of years now, basically. Um, and a lot of organizations are getting to the point where they're trying to decide and start implementing Docker containers um, in their production pipelines. And that kind of begs the question of, you know, kind of where are you at? Think about yourself, where are you at? If you heard about Docker, you can do the tutorial, you've done some POCs, or you're doing it in production. And if this was a, is a fairly standard audience, I ask this question when I go out and, and give this live. Um, a standard, fairly standard audience, um, you know, most of you are gonna be at the, um, you know, at the POC stage or the, I played with the tutorial stage. Uh, very, very few hands ever come up in an audience and say, yeah, I'm using Docker in production. Um, and so it begs the question, why not? You know, we all love Docker. Uh, we all think Docker is a great thing to use. Um, so why aren't more people using it in production? And I think at least that the reason for this is that at the end of the day, we're not sure how to trust Docker when we run it in production. You know, we love the technology, but there's just lots of things that make, say, your average ops guy a little bit queasy when he thinks about Docker. And a lot of what I want to talk about today is how I think we can go about fixing that, building confidence in our Docker images so that everybody is happy to run them in production. So um, unsurprisingly, if you're at a JFrog webinar, um, a key component of my discussion today is going to be uh, the idea of mixing um, JFrog Artifactory and Docker, although in fact, everything I'm gonna talk about today could be done without Artifactory. It's, um, in my opinion, at least a little bit easier to do with Artifactory. And, um, you know, the things that uh, JFrog brings to the Docker story are, first of all, just decades of experience managing binaries. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for maturity of product when you're talking about deep infrastructure. And that's important. I mean, if we're going to start using Docker in production, we need to have infrastructure around Docker, and that infrastructure has to be just as reliable as everything else. And so the maturity that JFrog brings to the infrastructure allows trust in your Docker infrastructure. Um, that's a critical starting point. Uh, we've been doing um, private registries right from the beginning. We were the very first private registry out there even before um, you know, other, other companies, including Docker themselves, provided their open source registry. JFrog had gone out and implemented a private registry that could be used um, in private data center infrastructures. Um, and the other big thing is that we understand promotion pipelines for Docker. And that's a lot about what we're gonna talk about today. So, and the final thing about why use Artifactory when it comes to Docker is this simple thing. Who's using Docker and nothing else? And the point is, you can ask this question and not a single person will raise their hands. Because Docker is a container and the nature of containers is that they ship things. And what they ship is other platform binaries. 
So back to our main point, we wanna use Docker in production. It's a, a trite saying, but so true, every company is a software company. And if you want proof of that, all you need to do is uh, think about JFrog, which is essentially just building um, you know, tools for software development and management and uh, distribution, and realize that there isn't a single industry that isn't a customer of JFrog. And you know, for me, that was actually, you know, when I first came to JFrog, that was a little bit surprising. You, know, you always hear that every, software is, is, every company is a software company, but until you see just the scope of the industries involved in the software business, it you know, can be really startling just you know, how true this statement really is. And what that means is that no matter where you are, you care about things like Docker. You care about things like trusting software in production. You care at the end of the day about accelerating the dev pipeline. And Docker is widely recognized as a key technology in doing that if you can manage to use it in production. So a simple goal that I would argue applies to pretty much anybody is how do I develop a life cycle for Docker containers? So I'm an architect, and as an architect, I ask a simple question whenever somebody asks me, how do I do something? I ask the question, do we have an existing pattern? And if we do have a pattern, do we need to adapt it? So <clears throat> the first thing is to think a little bit about Docker containers and their purpose. Uh, and there's lots of different ways to use Docker containers, but you know, in one of the more common uses of Docker containers, we're considering them basically as sort of a light, um, a light server providing a service or a microservice, as the case may be. And so, the first pattern you tend to think about is patterns for maintaining servers. And so, the traditional server pattern is, um, you know, that I go and I build a server image, I provision that image and I apply configuration changes as needed to keep that image up to date. And eventually, the life cycle of that server becomes um, you know, unwieldy, and I start all over again. Uh, but this isn't really the model for Docker. Uh, trying to make a configuration change to a Docker image, while it's certainly possible, is a bit of a pain, and quite intentionally so. Um, and that brings us to the immutable server pattern which has been used um, by a number of people with and without Docker, uh, where the idea is that I create an image um, and I provision that image and if I need to make a change, rather than try to make a change on that image immediately, I just create a new image. One of the really cool things about the immutable server pattern is that every change is fully tested on the actual system I'm putting in production. That's one of the big differences that this implies, or does it? So you have to ask yourself, you know, these server patterns are patterns about, you know, how to manage the Docker container in the production, but we also have to ask about how to develop it. And to do that, I ask myself a simple question. Is Docker more like a Debian package, or is it more like a WAR file? And when I actually thought about it, you know, a Debian package is an application plus a declaration of a bunch of dependencies. A WAR file is an application plus dependencies wrapped up in the same binary. And so Docker is just like a WAR file. In reality, this shouldn't be terribly surprising to us because back when WAR files were introduced, it was about web containers. And Docker is about basically taking container to that next level of an OS container instead of just a web container. And when it comes to building WAR files, this is something we know how to do. As a community, we've been doing this for many, many years. And JFrog definitely has, you know, kind of a, a clear, well-defined strategy that we recommend to our customers um, and that our platform enables. Um, and it starts with the concept of quality gates, right? I have a development environment 
which is you know, used by my developers at their desk. Uh, they pass through a quality gate to do their commits. Then I have the actual uh, CI environment. Uh, that gets through a quality gate of a successful build. And then you start the system test. Then you get a staging. And then eventually I get into production. And at each level, if I fail the quality check, the process stops and starts all over again. So what does that actually look like? Well, again, everything starts with a developer writing awesome code. He does builds on his desk with the build tool of his choice. Uh, the build tool is going to resolve dependencies from Artifactory. And if Artifactory doesn't already have that artifact, they're going to go out and get it from a central repository out on the web. And then when the developer is confident in her code, she's going to commit it to a VCS system. And, that, um, and then the VCS system is going to be passed off to a CI system, which is polling that VCS system. And whenever there's a change, it's going to go off and do a build with the same tools the developer was using. And it's going to, again, resolve the artifacts from Artifactory. Uh, the thing that's now different is that the CI system is also going to deploy those artifacts to Artifactory. Um, and so now you have a built artifact that is in a system of record, which is Artifactory. And then it goes through the promotion process, which is, in general, a metadata contribution process. There's lots of sources of metadata um, from JFrog X-Ray to uh, your test suites to whatever source of metadata you may be doing as you go through your various quality gates. And then at the end, it's going to deploy out to production with a provisioning tool like Chef or Puppet, or my software is something I'm giving out to customers and I'm distributing it on a tool like JFrog Bintray to go out to the world. This is a very well understood process. If you've attended other JFrog webinars, you've probably heard it before. Um, and to some extent, part of what we're going to talk about is, you know, that it works no matter what the technology is, and that that includes Docker. So how do we actually create a Docker image? Well, we use Docker Build. And the cool thing about Docker Build is that Docker Build is amazingly easy to use. And the thing about that is that there's a very strong temptation to just always use it. You know, a Docker build is really easy. It's light. It's often actually faster than pulling a pre-built image um, because, you know, it's a much smaller build overall uh, of things you need to pull down from the web. And there's a strong temptation, hey, it's, it's fast. It's easy. I should just Docker build all the time. Uh, in all of these environments, I'll Docker build as a dev. CI will Docker build when I want to go into test or production. I'll just Docker build the image and run it. So as I said, that's often a faster way. Um, it uses less resources, um, if uh, depending on what resources you care about. But just because something is faster and cheaper does not mean it's a good idea. Thank you very much to JFrog Marketing for, for coming up with this beautiful demonstration picture of why it is such a bad idea to build something the fastest and cheapest way possible. Um, so why not? Well, if we look at a Docker file, you know, we're going to see that um, pretty much everything in the Docker file is going to tend to point at a latest version. And this is very intentional. Right, um, because one of the great benefits of Docker is that I'm getting the newest software that has the security updates I need to have true confidence in my system. And at some level, I don't want to lose this. Um, but on another level, it's very, very much a hassle because it means I don't actually know what I get when I do a Docker build. I don't know that it's going to be the same every time I run it. Now, I could fix this. Uh, for example, I could put in this nice long hash string of the SHA-2 
of my Docker image when I pull Ubuntu. Um, and this would make it so that Ubuntu is not the latest image. It would be a very specific pinned image. Um, of course, I have no real idea what image of Ubuntu this Docker file is pulling. But if I do anything less than this, if I were to go with, say, a Docker tag, pull a specific version of Ubuntu, Ubuntu, again, adds those, the critical security updates into that tag and actually moves the tag. And I can tell you from bitter personal experience that while most of the time security updates are safe and great and we love them, sometimes they break your software. And there is nothing quite like having a supposedly risk-free security update take down your production environment to make you paranoid. Um, and it's not just that. I mean, the rest of this image is also very indeterminate. It's got transitive dependencies going on as it does an app get install. And there's things I could do using Artifactory, et cetera, to pin it all down. But the more I pin it down, in some ways, the more I'm giving up all of the benefits that I have from doing Docker. It's not really the strategy I want to do to make my Docker files completely immutable so that I could actually do a Docker build in every location. Um, because it's just, you know, even if it's, if it's possible, um, I'm costing myself quite a lot. But if I don't do that, then, and I'm doing a Docker build in every image, in every location, I get something like this. You know, in dev, I go and I build it, and I get one fingerprint of the image. A day later, it goes through test, they build it again, they, they get a different fingerprint. A day after that, uh, we go to prod, and it goes through test, and it gets yet another fingerprint. And you might say, oh, well, my velocity is high enough that I don't have to worry about this. But it's always possible. And if you were to go and you were to tell your ops guys, hey, I have, um, or you were to tell pretty much anybody, hey, I have this Java war, and uh, I'm going to give you a different binary uh, in production than the one I put through test, uh, it is very possible that, um, that somebody somewhere would come for your head the first time something broke. Uh, and justifiably so. When you're going to do a promotion process, you want to do it with immutable and stable binaries. Because in reality, if you're not doing that, then you're not really testing before you go into production, except for basic functional tests. No matter what you tell me about oh, I did a performance test. If you're not doing a performance test on the actual image that's going into production, how do I know that you know, you've actually passed the requirements to go to production? These are the basic questions we've been asking in the test environment for years. And the solution is well known. The reality is you build at the beginning of the process, um, at CI, and after that, you promote the pre-built binary. So rather than take a building that's going to fall down because of a bad foundation, I wanted to look into how do we correctly design a process for developing a Docker container? How do we do it right? but in a way that doesn't give up all of the power, the flexibility, and the speed that Docker gives us. So what is a Docker container? Well, a Docker container has, is just like a normal container. It has pieces and parts. I'm gonna go with a fairly simple, but fairly common sort of Docker container. Um, I'm going to have a base image um, from Ubuntu. I'm going to have a framework on top of that base image uh, that is uh, Java and Tomcat. And then I'm going to have a WAR file. Pretty standard. Um, you know, this could be a description of pretty much any standard web application that's in its first stage of containerization. So what are my requirements? Well, the WAR file itself has to be tested, uh, but it has to be deployed in containers. 
Um, and the reality is that probably, um, you know, my test environment is going to be container-based for this WAR file. It's critical that the framework be known good, um, but it still has to update regularly to address vulnerabilities. One of the great powers of Docker is its ability to quickly get these security um, vulnerabilities in and go through with the immutable server model um, with fast updates to address security concerns. Uh, but I definitely want whatever sort of updates to the base and framework layers, I don't want that to be mixed in to my pipeline. I don't want to have a question as to, you know, when I'm working on my application and something breaks, I don't want there to be a question as to whether I broke something in my code or whether something got broken um, by the base layers of my image. And so to do that, we need to build a couple of pipelines. So we're going to have a war file build with unit tests. We're going to have a framework build, which is going to be a base image with JDK, with Tomcat, with some security tests. And we're going to have an integration build, which is going to take the latest version of the war file and put it into um, a known good framework build. So let's start with building a war file. We've been doing this a long time. It's a great old build. We know how to do this. So I have a simple Jenkins job that um, does a Gradle build, and it will deploy it to um, a dev repository in Artifactory. And then stuff is going to happen. As it turns out, in this case, um, it's not going to be part of this pipeline because it's going to be tested in the container scenario. And it will be promoted to release. And once it's promoted, I'm going to have to move that WAR file from my dev repository to my release repository. Another one I've got is the framework build. So I have a simple Jenkins job that's going to build a Docker framework by doing a Docker pill of Ubuntu, doing a Docker build, adding JDK 8, adding Tomcat, going to X-Ray, and then uh, it's going to push that up to Docker dev local in my Docker dev repository. Uh, so a note here about uh, Docker repository structure. Probably what you're going to want to have inside your artifactory is two virtual repositories um, that aggregate various locals and remotes. So I have a Docker dev repository, which aggregates Docker dev local, Docker prod local, and Docker hub. And this is my base repository that I'm using for pulling and pushing my images. And you can see in Docker dev that it has a default deployment repository of Docker dev local. So whenever I push an image, it's going to go to Docker Dev Local. And then I have Docker Prod. All it has is Docker Prod Local in it, in this particular case, which is my Purity Prod repository. And importantly, it has no default deployment repository. So this is a read-only repository in the strictest sense of the word that, you know, literally there is no right uh, direction in this virtual repository. There, there is no right endpoint provided. Um, so I can be very, very confident that things are only getting into Docker prod local via, via a curation mechanism. And if I were to go out and look at the Docker file that I'm building, It'll look a little bit like this. Uh, up at the top, I'm pulling Ubuntu, and then I'm adding the JDK, I'm adding um, Tomcat, and creating the image. 
And so I can actually do this. And this will take a few minutes to build. Um, and then I can Docker push it. And then um, if I were to go out to my repository here in Docker prod, in Docker dev local, I'm going to see in my framework, I have a build two. And then I want to retag build two to be my latest image so that um, my latest dev image so that I can run a Docker framework test. So to do that, I'm going to use the Docker Promote API. Um, and I'm just going to say here that I'm uh, going to the Docker Dev local repository. I'm retagging Docker Framework. I'm retagging tag two. Its target tag is going to be latest. And I'm going to do a retag by copy in this case, because I still want to preserve the build two as a thing. And then I'm just going to run my curl command here. I will go out and get my API key. And now, if we look at it, um, it would be a little bit hard to tell. Uh, in this particular case, but the latest image is now pointing at number two instead of where it was before, which was a uh, previously promoted image. And then I can run a test. So the test of this image is to do a Docker build with the released WAR file and run the standard test. And um, so, and then after that, I'm going to do a Docker promotion to move my image from Docker dev local to Docker prod local. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this Docker file a little bit later. And we're not actually going to go and run this step right yet because. This step right now begs the question of where do I get a release war file? I don't have one yet. Um, so there is a prime the pump issue here. Uh, but before I started this out, I'd already done a, uh, you know, I ran through a series of tests. And so I'd already built a framework build that I trusted from before. Um, and so then I can go into doing the actual application pipeline. So building the application gets a little bit more complicated. My actual build job is going to be pulling a snapshot war file. And it's going to be pulling the prod version of the framework image. So this is very important. This is the version of the framework that's been tested and approved. And then it's going to build that, and it's going to put it out to Docker Dev. Uh, so it looks pretty simple, right? I grab a, um, I grab the image, I add the war, and that's basically all that's required because I've already got a Tomcat in place. And then 
I can push out this. And then I'm going to run tests on this artifact. You know, it's now, if we go out into, um, into our Docker dev local here, we're going to see that I have Docker app number two. So I'm going to retag that to be latest so that it's picked up by my test environment, or I can just run the test straight on build number two. I don't really need to have a latest version of the app because I'm not iterating it in the same way as I'm iterating other things. Um, so I might just do a straight up test of this one. Uh, and once I've tested it, then I'll do another promotion. So this will be a little bit different uh, on the JSON because I'm not uh, retagging this artifact right away. I'm just moving it from dev local to prod local. And I don't really want to do a copy in this case. I want to do a move. If you remember, my dev virtual um, stacked them up together. So if I ever want to get this build again in dev, it's still going to be accessible. So I don't have to do a copy anymore. And we'll run our curl command here. Again, grab my API key. And now if I look at my Docker prod, there's build two of Docker app. And then I'm probably going to want to do a retag so that this is now the latest version that's going to get picked up when people go and ask for the latest version of my production container. Um, and so that'll work pretty much the same way. Um, except now, instead of going to Docker Dev Local, I'm going to go to Docker Prod Local. Now, at the same time, I should be pasting my, um, I should also promote my war file. Uh, via build promote into the release repository. And now that I have a release war file, I could look at how the framework build works. And I want to show you something about the Docker file in the framework test. The only difference between these Docker files is that my local one is getting the image from Docker dev. And the one that's actually building my application is getting the framework build from Docker prod. And other than that, I'm doing the exact same test. When I test my framework, I'm actually testing my framework against the exact same sorts of tests that I'm running, that I'm testing my production image against. Um, now, the other difference, which is not actually clear in the, in the Docker file, is the fact that the war file here is a release war. Whereas in the other war file, I was just getting um, a, um, I was just getting the build, you know, I was getting a, a war file that had not yet been promoted. Um, and, you know, at the end of this, I can promote my framework build safely. And so, I've gone through and I've tested my app. And with the app, I, I uh, you know, as I said, I promoted the war file. I promoted my Docker image. I've shown you how that loops back for the framework test. 
this is kind of the whole path. You've got a gradle build up front. You have a, um, a Docker build, this green, that's basically running independently, rebuilding the framework. And I've got the Docker image build that's building my actual application for distribution, which is pulling in the framework build and pulling in the um, and pulling in the, the Gradle build and combining it into one very rapid release chain, which could then be promoted out to a distribution repository for JFrog Bintray or provisioned to my, to my production servers. Automated testing is everything here. Now, you might ask, is there any way for this pipeline to gem? And you actually kind of saw it in where we were at. So for the most part, this pipeline will run very, very smoothly in a very automated fashion. People will do their various commits. You know, the uh, security guys or whoever's worried about the framework will be updating the framework. The developer will update uh, his stuff. And at the end of the day, um, you know, all the builds will be triggered automatically as new components become available, either in code commit or because, um, you know, a, a new binary has been released. The only exception to this is if you are in the rare scenario where um, a security fix requires a non-backwards compatible change to the war. So normally, if you have a security fix, the security fix might indeed break your war file, but the change you have to make is something that would work in the old environment, right? So what happens then is you make the change to your war file, you prove that it works in the old environment just the way you expect, and then it comes in and it brings in that new war file and tests out the new environment and confirms that the new environment is ready. And then um, you have a new combination build of the new environment plus the new war file gets pushed out and you have a new secured war file and it's gone through a full automated process with no, no, no hiccups. On very, very rare circumstances, an API is just so insecure that um, you have to build basically an entirely new API. I can't say I've seen that very often in my career, but I have heard of it happening. And in that case, then yes, um, this framework will get stopped and you'll have to manually prime it just like you did at the beginning uh, to manually push through to build a um, release framework that's allowed just like you had to do at the beginning of the framework to get it started originally. But once you do that, everything is just gonna go in a fully automated fashion. So at the end of the day, we're back to the immutable server pattern. And do I have Docker images that I'm confident in where I'm provisioning them to production? Did I do it? So what would I need? What were my criteria of success? What do I need to do to have trust? So the first thing is, I have to have not lost the flexibility of automation. And I don't think I've done that. I have to have tested my binaries before they get into production. And in this model, there's a firm and absolute test of the Docker image before it's uh, promoted to the prod repository. The final Docker image is the same image that was built and tested. I think I did. You should make your own judgment. Please feel free to provide feedback. Um, you know, we're really interested in what people think about this sort of, sort of design, but this seems to be the direction that um, people are going when they need to build these, these prod sorts of scenarios. And the point is, it's all about speed. We're automating, 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 we're going fast. We're not giving up any of the speed of the technology. We're just building confidence while we're going fast. There's no point in going fast if you don't trust what you did. So um, with that, uh, I think we're about ready to, uh, to look into taking questions. Um, so let me see. What all we have?
Okay. So the first question was uh, back at the beginning, they asked if I could have just used Docker tag and not specified a version when you do Docker push. Um, so you always have to specify when you push, you, spe you push a specific tag. So I did basically use Docker tag at the beginning, but um, I had to do a Docker push of the specific version that I actually built. Uh, OK, could I show an example of promoting a Docker image from stage repository to public? So absolutely. Um, so let's go back and look at, at how that works. I did go through that kind of quick. So what I'm using is the REST API inside Artifactory for promoting Docker images. Here's the actual spec for that, uh, promote Docker image. It has a pretty simple JSON, which asks for a uh, target repository, the uh, Docker uh, image that you're infecting. Um, if you're moving it to a new Docker location, uh, you know, if you're renaming the image, you can rename the image here. Uh, what was the original tag and what is the target tag? And then whether you want to copy or move when you run this promotion. And it's a post that consumes this JSON. So, for example, if I wanted to uh, run a promotion of um, my Docker framework, from dev to prod, I'll look at um, my dpromote.json. And in here, I'm going to say that my target repository is Docker prod local. And my, um, my image name is Docker framework. The tag I'm going to move is number two, and I'm going to do a move instead of a copy, so copy is false. And then in my curl command, I go to um, API slash docker slash docker dev local, because the source image is in docker dev, slash v2 slash promote. I provide a content type header, and I feed it that JSON we just created. And then I give it my API key. And at the end, it's going to say the promotion ended successfully. And now, if I refresh the Docker framework, there's my number two image. OK, so um, another question is uh, setting up the read-only repositories. Um, so they mentioned that they're using a hosted artifactory. Uh, just by the way, this artifactory that I'm using here is also an artifactory online. Um, so everything I'm doing is something you can do in our SAS, in our SAS edition. So the key here was that I created a virtual repository. So I had previously created, in my local repositories, I had a Docker dev local repository and a Docker prod local repository that I created. And these are the actual physical repositories where my local images are going to reside. And then in my remote repositories, I have a repository that's remoting Docker Hub. And then I create a pair of virtual repositories, which are what people are actually going to access um, which are what people are actually going to access when they pull up the image. 
So I have the Docker dev repository where I pulled in Docker dev local, Docker prod local, and Docker hub. And then when I scroll down in virtual repositories, I have a default deployment repository option, um, which requires that I fill in Docker dev local so that I can then push to this Docker dev repository directly. Um, and then it will pass through from the Docker dev virtual repository into Docker dev local. Uh, and then for the prod repository, um, rather than having all of these images, I have a just the Docker prod local in there. And when I go down to the default report repository, I give nothing. And so there's no link here. There's no way to pass through a push. So this virtual repository is completely unwritable. Now, of course, I could do the same thing with permissions. And I should have done the same thing with permissions to prevent somebody from getting access to the prod repository through another mechanism you know, with a hosted artifactory um, the prod repository, um, you know, is going to have its own address that can be accessed. So I should have permissions to prevent people from doing that, except whoever it is has permission to run those promotion tasks I was showing earlier. But, you know, if you just give out these endpoints, these are the only endpoints available. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to do it with permissions, Um, you know, you can do the same thing using our permissions model, sorry, where you would just not give write access to most users to the prod repository. So that would be, uh, you know, when I go to create my write permissions on Docker, um, you know, I would have for the Docker, Docker dev local, right? I might allow basically all my groups to participate. And I'll allow them to do, you know, deploy and read. Whereas if I was building a Docker prod promotion, uh, permission, on Docker prod local, um, users and readers would have read permissions, but only promoters would have delete and deploy permissions. Uh, so another question was, when you rebuild the framework image, how do you know which app images need to be rebuilt? Uh, so that is, um, whenever I get a new framework image into production, right? So it's gone through, once the framework image has gone through test, right? Then any app image that relied on it should be rebuilt. Now, if I'm automatically rebuilding my app image um, every couple of hours because I have a very, very high velocity for rebuilding app images because of the WAR file is changing that fast, for example, then I might skip doing a triggering based on, um, based on the framework build being updated, right? I might just say, okay, the next time I do an app build, I'm gonna grab the latest framework build. I have the confidence that it's going to work because the framework build was built against the last successful app build. Um, you know, so I might decide to trigger just off that, but it's not going to be a critical matter, um, you know, in that case. If on the other hand, you know, my velocity isn't quite that high, then probably I'm gonna have an explicit trigger that whenever 
a framework build is promoted, um, the app build should be rebuilt. Um, and the triggers in general are going to work kind of that way. I'm going to trigger based on commits to code for the war file. Um, for the app framework, I'm going to be triggering new app framework builds based on um, knowledge of when new components have been updated, whether that's a new Ubuntu layer or a new JDK or a new Tomcat. Uh, and the app build basically triggers whenever there's a new war file that's been built or when there's a new, um, you know, or when there's been a new framework layer that's actually been released. Any other questions? Okay. So the question is uh, whether there is a way to ask Artifactory what the um, what the from image is, and the answer to that question is not yet. But uh, I think that. Um, this is something that, that uh, is coming soon uh, with basically a uh, build info concept for Docker. OK, we're getting towards time. I probably have time for one more question. Uh, best practice for cleaning up Artifactory. Uh, I'm going to say that that question is a little bit off topic um, for this webinar, but uh, you know, in general, you know, you're going to have using our query languages. You're going to know uh, what's going on uh, and you know what images are getting stale, and uh, clean them up that way. Um, and uh, it's kind of with cleanup that could be its own uh, long discussion. Um, with the Docker images themselves, um, you know, you can delete individual Docker images with confidence that you're not going to be breaking any other underlying layers. Um, and as terms of you know, how many snapshots should you retain, that's kind of up to you. Um, I generally say, as a general rule, first of all, any image that's ever gone into production gets retained forever. On the dev repository, I would tend to clean up uh, my snapshots, once I've gone through a full release cycle, uh, you can pretty much clean up all the old snapshots as a general rule unless you have some other reason for keeping them. Um, it depends a little bit on your velocity. If you're going really, really fast, there may be advantages to keeping a couple of cycles worth um, in case you, know, you really need to backtrack a long ways. Uh, but you know, for most cases, let's say you know, I'm releasing a new Docker image once a week then you know, whenever I do that release, I can probably clean up all the snapshots that I used along the way to get there. Uh, and that pretty much uh, brings us to the end of time. Uh, as a reminder, um, you know, these webinars continue, continue on. We have um, other webinars going on at various times in various time zones. Uh, check them out, including our Every Tuesday webinar with training. Uh, and thank you very much for attending this webinar, and um, please enjoy the rest of your day.